Hello, everyone. I'm Ivo Dalder, President of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and this is World Review, our weekly look at news from around the world. And what a week it was. I'm looking forward to our discussion today with Nirmal Ghosh, who is the U.S. Bureau Chief of the Singapore Strait Times. Uh, uh, Nirmal, wonderful to see you. Hi, thank you. Hi there. And from Brussels, just uh, out of the mud, as they say, uh, from uh, visits to Germany and parts of Belgium, Steve Erlanger, chief diplomatic correspondent uh, from uh, the New York Times, who covered uh, the uh, overflowing rivers and flooding in that part of the world. Steve, great to see you again. Thank you. And Carla Robbins, who is now with the Council on Foreign Relations and formerly uh, with the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Carla, great to have you back as well. Thanks, Evo. As, as I said, it was a week, I think, where we saw global threats uh, hitting home at home uh, and people uh, living, uh, finding out that they have to live with these things uh, in, 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 a, in a pretty much a horrific kind of way. Uh, particularly, Steve, let's start with you. When you look at uh, climate change really uh, becoming evident for most people. Uh, you uh, reported from Germany uh, about the uh, historic once in the millennium flooding that now seems to happen twice a year uh, that was happening in, uh, in, in, in a smaller scale than New York City when the subways got uh, uh, flooded and in, is happening in China even as we speak, as, mo as a whole city uh, is uh, undergoing this kind of uh, terrible uh, flooding and much of the northwest of the United States is ablaze. Uh, climate change is hitting people uh, right where uh, they are living. Uh, tell us a little bit about what it felt like uh, walking around in the mud uh, in Germany and as people were confronting the reality that this is something that is not just a horrific event, but something that they will have to face uh, going forward. And we probably all will have to face in one form or another. Yes, and it's going to require big changes in our lives, which I don't think people have actually taken on board. I mean, climate is not just hitting us, it's killing us. I mean, it killed 170 people, at least in Germany alone. Uh, it killed uh, more than 90 in the little area I was in called the Arweiler. I mean, there's a tributary tributary of the Rhine called the R, which so much water came, a whole summer's worth of water came in two days. And, and, and that flooded this beautiful wine growing area of Germany um, and wiped away towns, wiped away people missing. I mean, the water was so high, so fast and carried with it cars and containers and tree stumps that it did huge amount of damage in a very, very short time. And then when it pulled out again, um, it, it, it destabilizes buildings. So that part of the problem is going to be not just cleaning up all this, it looks like 12 bombs hit every street, but um, a lot of these buildings will simply be structurally insecure. and and will have to come down. And some of them are hundreds of years old, beautiful inns, bridges gone. You, you know, you end up in towns, little towns, lots of villages where there's no electricity, no power, no cell phone coverage, at least it's summer, um, missing people, though some of them, you know, presumably will turn up, but a lot will be dead. Um, and, and people, what impressed me was the solidarity of Germans, which we don't often think about, um, but it's an agricultural area. So a lot of people have bulldozers and they have little tractors. And a lot of what of the cleanup was done by neighbors. It wasn't done by the state. Um, and, and this I thought was kind of very moving. People just kind of pitched in. But in China, we saw the same thing, a huge rush of water all of a sudden. I think, you know, a year's worth of rain in Henan province in three days and, and flooding, you, you know, the sight of these subway cars filling with water was really terrifying. So I think it's a wake up call. It's a wake up call for our adaptation. It's a wake up call to take warnings seriously, which people tend not to do. And it's also um, 
as you talk to climatologists, obviously floods happen, but there's more and more of these major events. And when they look at the Paris Accord um, and they look at this, this intention to keep uh, global warming under 2% um, over pre-industrial, over two degrees, under two degrees since pre-industrial times, we're not getting there. I mean, they expect more greenhouse gases next year than almost ever before as economies recover from COVID. And um, right now we're headed toward more like a 2.7, 2.9 degree increase, which is a lot. The Economist this week has a whole leader section on the three degree world and it's scary. So it's a wake up call, you know, there's a European Green Deal, but I just don't think people understand how much money investment and what kind of change in their lives will be required to get to carbon neutral by even 2050. So Nirmal, I think, I think the, the, the big policy issue that Steve put on the table is exactly right. How are we going to get the political will to, uh, to mitigate and adapt to this new world reality? The, the question I think we're, we're, we're confronting is um, the cost may be great, but if you've just seen your town wiped off the face of the map, whether it's because of a fire in Canada or a flood in Germany, um, the political will all of a sudden might be mobilizable. And so the question is, do you, do you see anything happening in terms of the mobilization uh, either in the United States or in other parts of the world where we really might finally get the kind of actions that are needed in order to, to deal with the challenge uh, that you know, was, was on all of our TV screens, but for, for people just like you and me and uh, uh, was in their homes. Uh, and whether it's Chinese people like you or me or German people or Belgians, it's, it's right there uh, with us. Yeah, well, I wish I could say yes, but I'm not that optimistic, unfortunately. Um, as Steve was saying, I mean, the bottom line is we have passed the tipping points and yet we're still talking about tipping points. One obvious big tipping point is the Arctic, which is warming faster than any other place on the planet. Very soon, very much in the foreseeable future, there will be no ice formation at all. And what happened in the Pacific Northwest these past weeks shows that the effects of climate change do not manifest in an orderly manner. They basically come at you simultaneously from different directions. Heat waves facilitate wildfires, which create their own micro weather systems. Accelerating heat melts snow faster, so lakes and rivers rise, and then you have these violent storms. Essentially, all the most dire predictions are coming true right in front of us. And in places like California, these are the logical extension of larger trends. California does suffer from drought, as we know. You can make the case that California and parts of Oregon, parts of British Columbia, Canada are slowly turning into savanna. In the case of California, adaptation is going to be forced down their throats. It does produce a lot of crops, a lot of agricultural produce that is water intensive. So yes, we are being challenged to adapt. In some cases, market forces might help. For example, it's difficult, your insurance premiums are going up if you have a, a home on the waterfront in Florida, for example, other vulnerable areas as well. But in some cases, local authorities, federal authorities do need to relook at zoning. Where do you allow people to build? What crops do you allow people to grow? Um, but to me, there is also a sort of larger reality, uh, which is that we are entering a phase of extreme volatility, which was actually the planetary norm before our species was able to thrive in what is effectively what was effectively a narrow window of climate stability in geological time. So I don't want to sound like a prophet of doom, but the next generation, our children and the next after them will be living in an inherently unstable and volatile world, which was actually the norm before that, this period of stability. And we could well revert to extreme tribalism only to survive. Uh, I'm not very optimistic. Yes, we are being challenged to adapt. We can adapt, but on the other hand, we are doing things which are obviously contrarian. Uh, I just saw that uh, an Indian state government, Chhattisgarh, is auctioning coal mining blocks. Then you have tremendous um, uh, defense expenditure rising across the world. So we are doing things which are so obviously contradictory to the collective um, you know, um, stability of our future that I'm not particularly optimistic. I think we will have to be go through a lot 
and adaptation is going to be an ongoing process for a very long time and not a, and a very painful process. Uh, Carla, uh, any, any degree of optimism in your side when you look at your daughter's generation uh, uh, and their, uh, you know, belief that, you know, our generation really didn't do what needed to be done. Uh, do you see them mobilizing, beginning to mobilize in a way, not just in the United States and Europe? And Steve, I, I, I want to get your, your take on the, pol the political impact of what's happening in Germany, given the elections. Is there, is, do you see any change or is it just the easy life that we have been living in this in this geologically stable period, as, as, as Nirmal put it, um, uh, is just not penetrating to the, in the degree it's necessary in order for us to get political action? Well, my positive leading indicator, um, and I feel like I should have some positive here, is the enormous number of my students who are working on sustainability issues. That's what, that's the primary thing that they're interested in right now. Um, and these are people who aren't just wanting to go work for NGOs, but they're also people who want to go into the private sector. And so that's the adaptability question, the future of sustainability. They see this as a social justice issue, but they also see this as a, you know, future of their own, you know, profit-making potential issue. And so sustainability is a hot topic in graduate school right now. So that's the, that's the positive thing. The negative thing is beyond the fact that what we're talking about here sounds like a classic, you know, disaster movie every day when you turn on your television um, is that, you know, Biden ran on a, you know, a climate revolution and people voted for him. And every time you see the polling out there is that people get it, you know, they really do get it. And even the polling that says, are you willing to pay more? People say, I'm now willing to get it. But, you know, Washington keeps getting in the way for this. You know, a country like India, which has hundreds of millions of people who are living in the dark, has to make really, really tough political decisions. Am I going to continue to let people live in the dark? Because they don't really have the technology to make a decision. Coal is the only way they're going to electrify. I mean, that's just a really basic decision. Dark, not dark. For us, you know, this is a decision of... You know, the $2 trillion American jobs plan was supposed to be the climate plan and Biden made a compromise and all the climate stuff came out of it. So now the next, you know, infrastructure plan is supposed to do it. And President Manchin is holding this up right now because he comes from West Virginia. Our decisions are much easier than the decisions the Indians have to make. Now, can we solve this problem without the Indians on board? No, there has to be huge technological leaps to help countries like India, but that technological leap has to come from a place like the United States. And we never make those leaps without massive investment from the US government. I mean, look at the internet. So, you know, President Manchin's got to get out of the way. They have to move these things forward, you know, from, a, from you know, in government as well. Um, and, uh, I'd like to be optimistic about it, but Washington is really in the way right now. So, uh, Steve, in Europe, it seems to be there is, of course, at the political level, more of a consensus. You, 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 a couple of weeks ago, the European Union came out with a pretty significant uh, green initiative. Um, uh, lots of countries saying great in theory, maybe not so much in practice. So it's going to be a long road before it gets adapted. But green politics seems to be playing well. When you look at Germany, uh, which has an election in a couple of months. Uh, the Greens uh, are a major political force in German politics, and in this election, an even more uh, major political force. Are you seeing any a political shift because of what happened in Germany uh, that may lead to more political uh, agreement to act in a way that is necessary to start dealing with these issues in a country like Germany, because Germany needs to lead on these issues? Well, I would say not nicht, not yet. Um, people are still coping. I mean, they're coping with the disaster. The government is offering money and help. You would think the Greens would benefit. And I think in the end, they will benefit. But their uh, woman chancellor candidate, Annalena Baerbock, has, you know, everyone's been attacking her because the Greens had this moment. And she's made herself a bit vulnerable through some stupid things like a bit of plagiarism and not reporting some income from the party. And so the other parties have been trying to rip her down. She also decided to be discreet and visit these terribly flood hit places without a lot of press, um, trying to make the point. But 
she's also benefited in the sense that Merkel's chosen candidate, Armin Laschet, who's actually the president of North Rhine-Westphalia, which also got hit very hard, has not behaved very well. He was seen giggling behind the German president when the German president was making a very emotional speech in one of these hard hit places. He's had to apologize. Um, he's not perceived as, as showing much leadership um, in fact, Merkel had to go with him a couple days later to try to put her arm around him. Um, and so, and Olaf Scholz, who's the SPD guy, is probably the most qualified of them all. Um, the SPD is kind of lingering and, and he's, he's the sort of money guy. So I still think, you know, the Greens will end up being a junior partner in the coalition. They will be most interested in, in the environment and business and and finance, so they will have an impact. But um, it, right now you don't see it in quite the same way. And then on the European level, you're quite right. I mean, the European Parliament has put as a legal requirement that Europe become carbon neutral by 2050 and that it cut by 2035, 55%, I mean, these figures don't, don't mean anything, but by 2035, they have to be a long way toward that goal. And they've presented plans to do it, but of course the plans touch the car industry and they cup, touch the energy industry and they touch farming. And everyone is really worried that there'll be a new populism from people who see climate as an elitist project that ordinary people have to pay for because ordinary people don't live in cities always. They need cars, they have tractors. It's much harder for them. They live in houses, right? Um, and then, like the Gilets Jaunes in France who, 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 cre who created this protest over an environmentally imposed fuel increase, there's a real worry that, you know, climate is going to create further kind of populist politics. So it's it's hard. I mean, I've gone on too long, I think, but it's Europe that's supposed to lead the way, right? I mean, this, this rich, huge place, and it's hard. It's really hard. Well, uh, we're not going to solve it here in 45 minutes, uh, unfortunately, because it is a, a, a tremendously important issue, but I can guarantee we were going to come back to this issue. We are living in an era in which uh, the instability of a changing climate is uh, is becoming evident uh, in our daily lives, and it's affecting our daily lives. And the question of how you mobilize that politically to make changes is, I think, going to be with us for 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 a long time. Um, uh, I said when we started out that uh, this this we're going to talk about a lot of the global threats that are affecting people in their daily lives. And your mall, the next big thing we want to talk about is the Delta variant. Uh, of the uh, uh, of the coronavirus that is uh, spreading really rapidly uh, through Europe now in the United States uh, into uh, Asia, particularly Southeast Asia, uh, into even Oceania. Uh, we're seeing it spreading, um, it's, and it's allowing uh, to do so because much of the world remains unvaccinated and increasingly it's evident that much of even the vaccinated countries is, are unvaccinated. Uh, and so this, this variant is able to spread. Uh, talk about uh, how this is manifesting itself in different countries and what are sort of the new debates that people are talking about in terms of vaccinating mandates, in terms of uh, thinking about new uh, lockdowns and restrictions. Uh, and, and how that is playing out politically. Yes, I've been uh, looking at the um, rise in cases in Southeast Asia, and there should be global alarm. Uh, we can start with Singapore. Singapore earned high marks, as we know, last year for its epidemic management in the beginning. It, was, it is a leader in Southeast Asia in terms of vaccination. Close to half of the population as of now has been vaccinated. But it has still had new outbreaks and it has been forced to revert to controls which again are strangling the service economy. Then you go to Thailand, which is in particularly bad shape, 15,000 cases a day officially. And anecdotally, that number is at least three times higher. Thailand failed in making and distributing enough vaccines. In fact, the National Vaccine Institute just last week had to apologize for the slow vaccine procurement and said it was looking at joining the 
COVAX Global Vaccine Initiative, you know, the vaccine, the vaccine sharing scheme. Imagine only now are they looking at that option. Then we have Myanmar, which is in a truly desperate state. COVID-19 has exploded and we knew that was bound to happen. And here we are. It's, it's almost pointless looking at data because none of it is really reliable. But what is absolutely certain is that Myanmar, which is, as we do at which is sort of at the crossroads of Southeast Asia and South Asia with very porous borders and politically in a state of, economically in a state of collapse. It's in terrible shape. And there have been calls. I just saw a tweet minutes ago from uh, Tant Mintu, the historian, uh, calling for international intervention, humanitarian intervention, uh, essentially to address this emergency. Otherwise, you will have a country at the heart of Asia, which is a potential source of dangerous future variants uh, or super variants. Um, then you have Malaysia, which is having cases of up to 16,000, I think, a day now. It's a little closer to having half its adult population with at least one dose of the vaccine. But we are seeing as across the region and even in Israel, which has a very good record and high vaccination rate, that is not enough. And last week, Indonesia overtook India and Brazil, can you imagine, to become the country reporting the world's highest number of daily cases, close to 50,000 daily cases. So. In Myanmar and Indonesia and elsewhere in the region, there's always a possibility for a new variant or super variant to emerge. And as we have seen here in the US, with 280,000 new cases in the last seven days, we are seeing breakthrough cases as well. Provincetown, Massachusetts, uh, an episode in which vaccinated people got COVID, it was a huge red flag. Now, this is a problem in terms of messaging in the US and elsewhere. Breakthrough infections are bound to happen. We know that. But when you highlight them, that fuels vaccine hesitancy. People who are hesitant will say, well, the vaccines don't seem to prevent the disease. Of course, the point is that if you are vaccinated, you can still get the disease, but you will have a mild case. But how do you adjust the messaging? And that is a huge challenge. And just as the US was learning from places like Singapore and Taiwan in the early days last year, countries now need to learn from the US. I was just looking at how the US managed to vaccinate something like 70% of its senior population. And the key was low tech, door to door calls and support to overcome vaccine hesitancy, very basic healthcare. Uh, but I mean, the bottom line is there has to be a shift in the narrative, a shift in the messaging. You know, they can, you can say COVID is endemic, it will remain endemic just as the flu is endemic. And we have to learn to live with that. But there are two problems it is difficult to learn to live with it if we don't have enough vaccines in the first place or can't get enough people vaccinated. And we've seen how incompetent some governments are, whether they are democratically elected or not. And second, we have, we have not learned to live with it yet. We are hyper reactive to outbreaks. So the challenge really remains the same to bring vaccination rates up. That is the basic bottom line. And in many countries that is not happening. Carla, the, I think uh, Nirmal puts his finger on it. It is, in the end, all about vaccination, both because without uh, vaccination, more and more people will uh, get uh, sick and, and, and may die. And the variant, uh, the strains may, may, may mutate uh, over time and ultimately, perhaps to the extent that it can defeat the vaccines. Um, and, and so we really need to find a way to vaccine uh, people. Uh, we've done the easy part. Those who wanted to get the vaccine and were eager to uh, have been able to get it. Uh, there still is a group of people who are eager to and can't get it. Uh, it's important that we reach those people, but there's also a group of people that doesn't want to that doesn't want to be vaccinated. And it's true in all countries. Uh, very different approaches to this uh, in different countries. The French have just uh, decided that if you're not vaccinated, um, as, as Macron put it, uh, it's time for you to stay home. And we go out. You can't go to a restaurant. You can't go anywhere if you're not vaccinated. Uh, huge protests in France, but also even larger numbers of people going out and getting their uh, their first shot. Uh, how do you look at, at, at this vaccination challenge, which is really uh, at the core, not only in the United States, of course, but globally, but even in the U.S. and Europe? So, you know, in the United States, we don't have a problem with access. We got more than enough vaccine. I mean, you walk down the street in New York and people are like begging you to get vaccinated. Um, the problem we have here is yes, among certain groups, there is vaccine hesitancy in part for mistrust, you know, because of historic 
you know, mistreatment of certain groups. But more than anything else, this is a red-blue divide. You know, you can crunch the data a host of ways and it all comes out the same. It was a Washington Post ABC News poll that said 47% of Republicans says they weren't, like, weren't likely to get vaccinated compared with just 6% of Democrats. You know, last month, the Kaiser Family Foundation reported that 86% of Democrats has had at least one shot and only 52% of Republicans. 47% of the counties that voted for Biden were vaccinated versus 35% of the ones that went for Trump. I mean, you see these numbers over and over and over again, this classic, you know, polarized red-blue divide. And it really comes down to this sort of brewing anti-government extremism feeling. I mean, and it's just, it's, it's, you can't, it's very hard to get over that, you know, with, uh, with, you know, pop stars can tell you to, you know, can tell you to do it. It doesn't seem to be able to, to get through. Interesting thing is the Republican leadership right now um, seems to get be worried about it. Steve, Steve Scalise, who's number three in the House, um, and a very notable holdout, got photographed getting vaccinated. Even Fox News is pushing out a recut version of their PSA and linking to the government vaccine finder on its website this week. But whether the base is going to follow after going so far down the denial rabbit hole, it's just really not clear to me. You know, Tucker Carlson is still pushing out this message that, you know, that first they, you know, that they, you know, they make you take the vaccine and next they're going to come for your guns message. And that goes to this really, really fundamental thing. So if you're seeing these demonstrations in France, I, I mean, it is that same really fundamental holdout feeling in the United States and even fiercer in the United States. And the White House is really, really worried about it. I mean, I think the White House's expectation is, is that what we're going to have, and particularly if it gets worse in the fall, is we're going to have sort of rolling lockdowns, rolling masking up, depending on what happens in different places. And in L.A., people are going to go along with it like they already are. Are they going to go along with it in Mississippi or in Alabama? Probably not. And all of the things you said were going to happen even were going to happen, which is more people are going to get sick, more people are going to die. And there is a possibility, not a guarantee, but a possibility that you know, we'll have new, even more frightening variants than the current one. Steve, how is it in Europe uh, where vaccination rates are catching up to the United States? I think Belgium now has more it, people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's uh, it, the U S stopped and everybody continued, but um how does it look there? To what extent do you see this debate? And, and how has Macron's really quite remarkable vaccination mandate, uh, very tough, uh, saying basically, if you're vaccinated, you can do lots of, you can do what you want. If you're not vaccinated, you can't. Um, the debate's happening in our workplaces. It's happening everywhere. But this is a national law uh, that, uh, that he's pushing through. How, how is that being perceived? And are others going to copy it? Well, as you know, the French always like to think of themselves as revolutionaries, but they want nothing to change. That's a very French view. <laughs> and they're very anti-statist. And Macron is kind of presidential, you know, king-like. So the French are special. Um, now there is vaccine hesitancy. I think it probably helped because as soon as he said that, a lot more people went to get vaccinated. In Belgium, that's not such a problem. In Belgium, you've got people running around trying to get vaccines for the illegal immigrants. I mean, people without papers, right? I mean, because everybody has to have it, right? Um, in Germany, also, the take-up's been pretty good. The real worry is, as I said, partly political, and it's it's the sense people had was, oh my God, thank God with the vaccine, it's going to be over. Now this realization that it's not over is kind of deeply depressing to people, right? And there's a lot of confusion about where to wear a mask and who has to wear a mask and so on and so on. The EU does have this um, COVID vaccination certificate, which, which is very helpful. Um, but the, the worry is you're gonna get another wave, you're gonna need booster shots, that's all very expensive. Will the state continue to pay for all that? Um, you know, winter is going to be harder as it always is. And the economy is lagging. That's the problem. I mean, look at Britain, right? I mean, Boris Johnson has opened up Britain against basically all medical advice, partly because he promised to, partly because he, 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 he thinks it's politically right, and partly because the economy has to work. So... I think, you know, even when there isn't so much vaccine hesitancy, though there is in Europe too, 
there is a kind of a deeper unease that um, we thought we were through the worst of it and maybe we are, but it ain't over and it's not gonna be over for quite a long time. I think that's the, uh, the reality that, that uh, people are starting to confront. Uh, there was sort of this sense of liberation when, when, when you had your, your second shot, the two weeks were over and you were fully vaccinated and you started to do things again that, that uh, became normal and much of your society did as well. And now the reality is this pandemic, because that's what it is, uh, is with us until, uh, until we've either figured out how to get rid of it or how to, how to live with it like the flu. And as Nirmal said, uh, that's going to take a lot more vaccination for a lot more people around the world. It's yeah. going to take a lot and, of time. I mean, also, to, uh, just I mean, I mean, just kids, right? I mean, kids who don't really get it very much, but they pass it on. Right. Exactly. I mean, and young people. So, I mean, how do you control? Yep. And anyway, it's it's um, it's uh, it just means we. It, it's, it is going to be with us for uh, for for uh, just as climate change as this thing's going to be with us. And another thing, Carla, that's going to be with us to to transition to our third subject. Uh, <laughs> Another our, cheery our, subject, Eva. Yeah, our, diff, different kinds of viruses. Uh, they, these are these are computer manipulated viruses. Uh, we we've had some astounding cyber uh, news this week, uh, starting with uh, uh, the coordinated accusation uh, by Western countries of China uh, and its use of uh, of uh, non governmental hackers. Uh, and then this remarkable journalistic uh, enterprise of 17 media organizations uh, digging deep into Pegasus, uh, some kind of software, some kind of virus that is infecting our phones. Uh, bring us up to date, Carla, on where uh, this new uh, pandemic, uh, if we can call it uh, a computer pandemic uh, generated pandemic, um, uh, ha is heading this week. So hacking and spyware and ransomware, oh my, um, technology is a scary thing out there, Evo. Um, so first on China, we've known about China and the Microsoft hack since March or so. This was a massive hack around the world and a completely irresponsible one since the tech folks say the Chinese hackers not only broke the door down, but they left the door open for everybody else. Um, and the interesting thing is why it took the Biden administration so long to speak out about it when they've been pushing on the Russians for a long time. And But they did finally get around to talking about it and they did do something, but not a lot. They organized the EU, all the NATO members, Australia, Britain, Canada, Japan, New Zealand, I think, to condemn Beijing for the cyber attacks. Um, but they didn't take any concrete punitive steps in part because I don't think the Europeans wanted to do anything in concrete, but in part, I think, because the Biden administration realizes that sanctions don't have much impact, certainly not on the Chinese, and they don't seem to have much impact on the Russians. And Biden and co are still hoping they're going to negotiate some sort of understanding with the Russians and the Chinese on mutual restraints. You're not going to get arms control, but some sort of mutual restraints and some sort of understanding that there are certain targets, critical infrastructure that's just got to be off limits. You know, that you're not going to take down water systems, that you're not going to take down airplanes from the sky, that you're not going to take down hospitals. Uh, Biden, after his meeting with Putin, said he gave him a list of 16 critical infrastructure projects, and he seemed to think that he was drawing a line that was of mutual interest to, you know, to Putin um, and, and to the Americans. Of course, you know, a few weeks later, the Russian hackers were back with their ransomware again. Um, whether they can get through to the Chinese and the Russians, I don't know. I think this is a reasonably sane idea. Um, mutual restraints on critical infrastructure. It goes, it's consistent with the laws of war. Um, basically, that's the way you negotiate deals. Um, and I don't buy the notion that these are somehow rogue actors in these states at all. Um, I think they're pushing the right way, but um, I don't know whether they're going to get there. So, you know, that's sort of my take on the China stuff. The ransomware thing, the Pegasus, first of all, it's a magnificent journalism exercise um, and done, you know, with amnesty and with, you know, it's a very interesting relationship between NGOs and, and journalism, uh, very deep, you know, journal, journalistic reporting that required an enormous amount of forensic work as well, digging into the actual phones. But what it was, was that there is this Israeli spyware company that claims it just sells to governments to go after terrorists and criminals. 
Um, but what they found out was that these governments, autocracies and a couple of alleged democracies like India, um, were infecting you know, the phones of journalists, of politicians, of business leaders, of activists, of opposition leaders, including Emmanuel Macron, including journalists from the New York Times, from CNN, from the AP, with this spyware um, that could read your emails and listen to what you were doing. And uh, there's just an extraordinary list of people who were hacked with this. Um, the company says, you know, somebody's got to stand the line against against criminals, against criminals, and and all. But the reality is, is this has become a tool for autocrats, and that is a pretty scary thing. Um, and your iPhone that you thought was safe turns out is really not safe. Yeah, I, I never really thought my iPhone was safe, but that's uh, <laughs> that's but, but, pretty but pretty, of- but not safe. Yeah, very pretty. Um, but uh, a point point is well taken. And there is this, I think it raises this larger issue of a private company uh, uh, that, that is developing technology and we're seeing it in the social media debate, but now we're seeing in the, in the hacking and spyware debate, a private company that uh, wants to be responsible and help law enforcement to go after really bad guys selling uh, this material, this, this, this equipment uh, and this software uh, that, can be used to go after, you know, Jamal Khashoggi and, and his family, as apparently this uh, software did. Uh, uh, Steve, what's been the reaction in Europe, uh, the European paper? By the way, I should, me- I should mention the Washington Post is part of that consortium. Uh, the Guardian is part of that consortium. A uh, lot of reporting uh, uh, around the world. It's a really a remarkable. Le Monde. Uh, uh, Le Monde. They're, they're, uh, you know, as I said, 17 papers in, in total. Um, what's been the reaction to... Uh, to, to the Pegasus uh, piece, which is sort of hits home, right, uh, in a way that perhaps the the China uh, Microsoft did not. Well, it's been um, all the usual suspects are horrified, you know, because all the privacy advocates and so on. Um, people are particularly annoyed again with Viktor Orban, who's the prime minister of Hungary, because he's one of the governments that bought it. I'm very struck that. A lot of people who were really very pro BB Netanyahu managed to buy this software. And that includes Mr. Modi and Mr. Orban. Um, And NSO, which is this Israeli company, I'm sure came out of the Israeli military civilian research complex, which is very, very good. It also invented ways, it invented lots of things, Um, but they need export licenses from the Israeli government. So I'm kind of interested in this nexus, um, whether the Israeli government, you know, had any real idea what the Hungarians might be doing. Now the Hungarians, to be fair, say we never used it in the way it's being accused of us. We didn't spy on journalists. We do, you know, need real surveillance equipment. There are real threats to us, but we did not break this kind of understanding. That's what they say. So, um, but I, I think it just is a reminder to er- everyone that, you, you know, nothing's safe, WhatsApp safe, maybe Signal's not safe, just to be careful. You've got to be careful. I mean, and, and, and living like this is no fun. I mean, it, and, and particularly if you're a dissident, if you're in Belarus, if you're, I mean, you really just um, have to watch it in a way that, Sami's dot won't help you, right? I think people are going to be doing much more writing things down and handing over things and living more like in cells. And I mean by that, almost like spying cells, small groups that don't connect to one another and trying to um, avoid this because nothing I think right now feels very safe. Can I just make one point here, which is that, is it, you know, the tech companies, of course, have, you know, huge, huge investment in, and this is a huge problem for them. Uh, it's certainly a huge problem for all of us, but it's a huge problem for them. If you recall, you know, Apple took this, you know, very principled and very criticized position after I think it was the San Bernardino terrorist attack, because they didn't want to unlock an iPhone, the iPhone of the attacker, when the U.S. government wanted information, there was the whole taking time bomb debate, you know, when do you stand on principle for privacy? 
Um, and now we found out that iPhones can be unlocked, that this is an entire technology that exists to, to do this. And the tech companies you know, are terrified that they're going to lose, you know, that, that this notion that there is no privacy out there makes their business very, you know, look a hell of a lot less, you know, valuable for, for people. So they're going to be pushing on a certain front. The privacy people are going to be pushing on another front. And then you get a guy like Macron, who the first thing he did was he changed his, you know, changed his phone and his phone number, I gather. And then second of all, had a security cabinet meeting yesterday. So we, we have lots of different people who are very concerned about this. Uh, Macron, of course, was one of the uh, sitting presidents whose phone uh, uh, number was uh, on the list of people who were uh, who were uh, penetrated, uh, so to say. Uh, Nirmal, uh, it's a global phenomenon, right? And and it's uh, it, it stretches all the way to Malaysia. And and uh, uh, how uh, how in your part of the world was has have people reacted? And then also China's right next door, and there's a lot of hacking going on and, uh, by the Chinese in, in 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 Southeast Asia as well. What's the What's the sense uh, in, 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 in your part of the world about, uh, about both the technology and the challenge it represents? Well, the Indian government, in, in response to the Pegasus project, the Indian government, sort of, its response was, can best be described as prevaricating and you know, wishy-washy. <laughs> and uh, even before this and subsequent to the revelations, we have had things like police raiding media organizations or a police officer just shows up and says, oh, this is just a routine check. And this happened just yesterday. Shows up in a major network and says, oh, this is just, just a routine security check. And so this is like clearly intimidatory, right? And it's, it's, uh, it's part of a pattern uh, in, in India, unfortunately, under this, uh, under this government. Uh, the media feels, uh, feels increasingly under siege. I mean, the media is divided, of course. There is some media much like the state, some media is really, really pro-establishment, uh, pro-multi. And for the rest of them who, uh, you know, have voices of uh, dissidents among them, they have been under severe pressure. And um, this is just essentially, I'm sorry to say, confirmed their fears that, you know, they're, they, they are being snooped on. And um, the as far as the Chinese uh, hacking is concerned, well, that's always been a risk in India. I have not seen... I have not seen any major incidents in recent weeks targeting India, but it is an ongoing risk. And given the, the state of India-China relations, I think it's a matter of time before that 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 con that sort of uh, uh, hostility uh, seeps into uh, the private sector in in terms of economic espionage and 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 hacking and so forth. But the media, for the for the moment, it is really the media in in India which is under tremendous pressure. Well, uh, the story does also have this sense of uh, of a Casablanca. I, I, I'm shocked. I'm shocked. There's spying going on, and and uh, I mean, as we started off with the story, we any was of surprise that perhaps our phones are being looked at, act by. Uh, uh, unseemly actors. Uh, certainly, I think anybody who's ever worked in government uh, doesn't think their phones are uh, or email or are, are safe. Uh, I assume that most the journalists uh, uh, have, you know, you don't want your government to do this, but my sense is that uh, how shocked should we really be? Uh, Steve, are, we, are you shocked that this is happening uh, in, in any way? No, no, no. I mean, you know, look, I've worked in Soviet Union when it was. I've worked in Russia. I've worked in Eastern Europe. I've worked in Israel. I've worked in lots of places where people are interested in who I'm talking to. You, you know, not that I'm, you know, deep throat or anything, but that but the New York Times is important to them and, and our contacts are important. So I've always tried to be really, really careful. Um, and uh, yet I'm sure if somebody wanted to, I mean, you know, they could get in. But I mean, I do really try, you know, not to put really sensitive stuff into the phone or out there. Um, but one does worry about it. And, and you get very worried about saying certain words on the phone because those are going to trigger NSA computers anywhere. <laughs> right. So I mean, yeah. just... You, you know, I mean, you also have to live your life and do your job. And my main thing is I don't want to get my sources into trouble. That's, that's, how I, that's how I try to operate. I mean, it's not me that I'm worried about. It's them. 
And that's the and, great and, and, luxury and, we have as Americans. That's the great luxury we have as American reporters is that we, we can luckily spend more time worrying about our sources than about ourselves. And, and it Absolutely, is worth, but, and, but and it worrying is worth about sources out, is important. Sorry, that, yeah. that NSO, none of those phone numbers were American phone numbers. There, there wasn't a single American phone number in that long list, sorry. Uh, and and I think uh, important to U.S. government has also never bought this, uh, and specifically no law enforcement. No one has bought it. Uh, the word is it doesn't work here. I don't think that's probably right, but I think there was maybe a political reason for making that argument. Uh, by the way, may, maybe uh, strengthening, uh, Steve, your, your inquiry about the relationship with the uh, former Israeli government. Um, with regard to uh, who, who to go after on these kinds of issues. Uh, lots of other issues that we uh, wanted to cover, including Nord Stream, uh, uh, which, uh, Steve, uh, for those of you who, uh, who want to follow it, uh, Steve wrote an excellent piece in the New York Times a couple of days ago about the new agreement uh, and its impact between the uh, German and U.S. government. So consult it. We will come back another time, I am sure, to that issue, as we will to all global threats that are having uh, impact on, in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, but for now, I want to thank uh, Nirmal Ghosh, uh, Carla Robbins, and Steve Erlanger for another great uh, conversation about some very hard and, and difficult issues. Uh, maybe we didn't solve all of them, uh, but at least we, un we, we have a better understanding, and that is uh, what uh, World Review is all about. This is it for this week in World Review. We'll see you again next week. Uh, uh, in the meantime, I want to thank all of you for joining us, and have a great weekend. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Bye-bye.